internet, and welcome back to another episode of Makers on Tap. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me tonight are... Joe, Chris, and John. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's a sp- very special episode today. It's, a, it's probably... Man, I can't remember the last time we did two episodes in a week. <laughs> yeah, right? It's been wow. a minute. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, John... Uh, Thank you for um, joining us tonight. I'm very excited yeah. about, um, to have yeah, you absolutely. here. Um, can you maybe give a, a little a brief introduction sure. about who you are and maybe why you're here? <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, I'm John Olhoff uh, of Lulzbot 3D Printers. Um, we got the invite to join the the uh, podcast tonight. And um, a lot of it just kind of sprung up through discussion in the community. Um, Lulzbot still aims to be a, a big part of the 3D printing community. Uh, it's a pretty close-knit group. but uh, Unfortunately, uh, the new Lelsbot, as some people like to say it, uh, didn't get a chance to connect at a lot of those events like uh, Murph and Earth this past year uh, due to COVID. So uh, any opportunity we can take to introduce ourselves and, and talk a little bit about what's going on, uh, we welcome. That's a very valid point. I didn't even consider that. That, that was yeah. a big miss. That like, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it was a big hole in everybody's heart anyway. Yeah. But uh, you know, you guys took over Lulzbot right after Earth 2019. Yep. Oh, and yeah. that that sale happened like that weekend. Hey, yep. You remember going to the Museum of uh, Science or uh, the Aerospace Museum, Aaron? And we're like, "What's going on?" <laughs> Everybody was bummed. Yeah that weekend just like everybody yeah. like no one knew it was happening so that's a valid point yeah i mean you took over right at right right when everything started to shut yeah. down yeah i mean at, at that particular time attending earth uh i had no idea we were even going to acquire lulz bot at that time so a lot of how i spent earth was just uh feeling that pain with every other vendor in attendance um the way that Aleph Objects had kind of conducted business toward the end uh, ended up harming a lot of people in a, in a community that I'm a big fan of and have a lot of passion for. Um, so I got to see that firsthand and that's never fun. Yeah. I didn't realize you were at or were you up with 3D mm-hmm. Fuel? Yep. 3D Fuel and then uh, Fargo 3D Printer Repair. So we were up on the second floor of Earth, but uh, it was really fun. It was really fun walking and, and getting to hear the speakers and stuff. And of course the, the Prusa mini and some good excitement out around that. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was nice. That was a great show overall. One day. <laughs> I, I, yes, yeah, so you guys want to get into this? <laughs> yeah, sure. We got, we got lots of questions. Lined up. Good. Uh, so I guess first off, what's everybody drinking? Ooh. Lining Kugel's Honey Vice for me. Oh, all right, all right. So, I have a triptych. It ain't much, but it's honest work. Just quite ah, good. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I am of the spotted cow variety tonight. So, enjoying uh, enjoying the classics. When's the last time you were in Wisconsin? Uh, not for a little bit. I got a hookup. <laughs> <laughs> if I would have gone myself, I would have gotten you some, but I, I, this person got me some. <laughs> well, that was the second question. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have water. Well, I, I haven't bought beer in a while. That's, that's I have water my, too. Uh, second one. <laughs> LTTstore.com. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So right. this was a legitimate question from the community, John. What's your favorite beer? Uh, actually, Line and Kugel's Honey Vice. But if you get me out to like the Redlands of California, uh, I worked out there for a while. There's a little place called Hangar 24, uh, and they make uh, Amarillo Pale Ale. I loved it so much. Uh, I actually bought a tap handle from the place. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of cool. That's oh, awesome. about it? Oh, I so, like the I like the propeller. That's that's pretty dope. Yeah. Yeah. So it the place can maybe have like ten people in it, but it's right across from uh, an airplane hangar. So you just go out there. 
uh, I was working in the milling industry at the time, flour milling. Uh, so we'd get done working and we'd head out there, um, order a pizza from a place called Strongman Pizza, and then sit and eat it and, and drink some beer. Heck yeah. Fair enough. Fair All right. enough. Then what was your first 3D printer? Yeah, so MakerBot Rep 2 um, was my first one that I actually owned. Uh, the uh, team up at uh, Fargo 3D Printing, they made uh, like shark parts, some aluminum conversion kits. Uh, so it was kind of cool. You could swap out some components, get a little bit better. You know, you still didn't have a heated bed, acrylic build plate type stuff. Mm-hmm. But hey, it, it's amazing what you could get done. You know, put down a raft or something to start with and you can print. Uh, that was the best printer MakerBot ever made, like still to this day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, fair enough. Fair enough. Chris, you want to get the next one? Uh, Maybe we can do like a round robin with these yeah, uh, sure. questions. So um, what was your, what was your background and uh, how did, how did you come to uh, really start getting involved with uh, open source companies like Lulzbot? Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends how far back you want to go. Uh, I didn't come from a hell of a lot, so fixing stuff, making things, that was kind of how I grew up. Uh, I took my first job in a machine shop uh, in my town of 300 people in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> um, turning parts at 16, and and uh, just went from there. We were running 1940s Acme Gridley machines, and um, it was from there I decided engineering was probably a good fit. Uh Went to NDSU for agricultural and biosystems engineering. Um, in practice, what that looks like is a lot of big machines and robots with PLC cabinets. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked for Cargill, uh, later became part of a large merger um, that was Ardent Mills, where you've got uh, ConAgra, Cargill, and CHS combining their milling divisions. Uh, every major metropolitan uh, area in the U.S. actually has a Ardent Mills pretty close by to keep the population fed. Uh, with flour, but uh, you use a lot of gravity and a lot of pneumatics. Flour mills are like eight stories tall. Uh, you actually pressurize pipes and push the flour to the top of the mill, and then you use gravity to either grind or sift, grind or sift the whole way down, and then you blow it back up to the top and start over until you get flour, which is an incredibly fine particled substance. Well. What was the safety systems behind that? Like, because like flour in its like floaty mm-hmm. form is super explosive. Super, super explosive. So you, <laughs> every plug in on all the floors, you got to have uh, explosion proof plug ins. Um, you've got uh, laser eyes on everything. Uh, so let's say one of your sifters gets out of balance and starts shaking past a laser eye, it's going to shut that portion down. Um, historically, like let's maybe look 60 years ago or so. It took 50, 60 people to run one of these plants. With the advent of uh, a lot of automation, you're looking at sometimes as little as five to eight people uh, to do the same amount of work. It, it's not glamorous. It, it's sweaty. It's dirty. But it uh, puts food on the table for a lot of people every day, from yeah. goldfish crackers to Domino's pizza. That's crazy. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. I, so, I suppose I, I suppose I should kind of loop that into how 3D printing came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, in college, I, I saw my first uh, rep wrap machine, uh, if you will, the threaded threaded screws and everything, and it was printing a benchy, and my mind was absolutely blown. Um, here in Fargo, we have Fargo 3D printing, so I went right over there and walked in and said, "You guys are hiring me." You know, it took a job for 725 fixing printers. Uh, everything from monoprice v2s and uh, xyz machines that are those funky play school colors you yeah. name it and, and just got fully indoctrinated i guess you'd say reading forums and learning machines um fast forward a couple of years I, I got out into industry uh, like i was describing a little bit ago i uh, did some sheet metal fabrication for a while uh, and the opportunity came up to uh, buy out the repair portion of Fargo 3D printing. Uh, so we kind of spun off a company that did uh, only repair work uh, in the background. Uh, we'd partner with uh, OEMs, we'd partner with uh, uh, Amazon, and 
you name it, the, the number of printers that are out there that uh, people like to have fixed uh, is actually pretty high. You know, there ended up being a, a need for it here in the U.S. So that's a large part of how I got started. Uh, okay. A little, little bit later on and just previous to Murph, um, I actually moved into the, the CEO role at uh, 3D Fuel, uh, producing filament for about one month uh, <laughs> before Lulzbot happened, which uh, kind of changed everything in, in my whole life and, and many of those around me um, in yeah, general. I would imagine. <laughs> so, Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, so the next question, um, how many uh, women or people of color are employed at Lulzbot and in what type of roles? So I thought it'd be kind of fun to actually pull some stats because I had seen this Twitter post. Uh, we have 60 people uh, working at Fargo Additive Manufacturing Equipment 3D. And of those 60, 17 are women. Uh, so 28.3% and 11 people are of co color. So that's like 18.3%. Uh, some of the positions they're in, uh, administration, uh, production, supply chain, sales, marketing, customer service, accounting, uh, and I guess kind of further more specialized production like 3D printing uh, production. I, I should split it like assembly and then like 3D printing, which is a little bit different in-house. So we're, we're a pretty diverse group. When we kicked off the year last January, we were still able to take group photos. And, and it's been one of the things we've lamented is we want to show people we've grown and that we keep doing stuff in Fargo, but eh, doing group photos, it's still not super smiled upon yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Um, from the, from that team, um, how many are from the original Colorado location? Um, or, and do you feel like this is an entirely new team or, um, do you feel like some of the old team is still there? Yeah. So, uh, for those of you who are a fan of the show WandaVision, I won't get into it too deeply, like spoiler wise, but one of the things brought up is the ship Theseus, uh, as a philosophical theory. Um, normally it doesn't apply to a lot of things, but in the case of Lulzbud, it, it might be a pretty good fit. Um, before I answer your question, backing up a little bit and taking a look at the timeline is probably the best way to kind of cook it down and look at it. Um, so we have the end of October. Uh, mm -hmm. Overnight, 90 of the 120 employees are uh, laid off. There's some put in kind of a holding pattern. Uh, and there's at least a week where uh, the company's a ghost ship. There's nobody, nobody there. Um, we stepped in. We started up... Uh, some form of operations immediately uh, to try to get people their jobs back and stuff while we were doing the paperwork, while we were closing on the asset purchase of ALIF objects. And uh, what you saw was quickly we had about 30 people uh, back on staff there in Colorado uh, working. Many of them would uh, continue on all the way through December and actually uh, up into January um, in that Colorado location. Um, almost all of them would be extended offers, uh, also relocation bonuses. That being said, it's really hard to get people to move for, to Fargo, especially from Colorado. <laughs> yes. um, so we, we certainly don't hold that against anybody. Um, for those that chose not to join us full time uh, when we did come up to Fargo, uh, we were glad to hear uh, that many of them had found uh, employment in the 3D printing industry. Uh, Dynamism had set up a new branch there. Uh, Sindaver West is now there. It's great to hear that they're still able to be in the community, still able to be contributing. That's that's all you can hope for. Um, like uh, as soon as like January hit and we were open in Fargo, uh, we had uh, I two people full time that moved here to live to stay. And about five more that continued to help us transition for another four months. Uh, so it's a, very much a phased question. Um, and at, at the end of it, you know, you can do your best to offer people jobs and ask them to come with, ask them to bring a lot of that uh, legacy knowledge and, and how things work with. But uh doesn't always happen. Uh, and that's kind of where that ship Theseus comes in, where 
we're Lulzbot. Uh, we might have some new wooden panels, but uh, we're definitely trying to embody and, and, and trying to drive this forward into the next uh, era of 3D printing. Okay. Fair enough. So someone from Twitter, uh, actually Richard Horn, asked um, if the open filament standard is still active. Yeah. I, and I wasn't even, I wasn't even <laughs> sure what that was, but thankfully you linked yeah, it for me. I, I guess it's what, it depends on what you call by active. Um, it's there. It's still available uh, along with basically everything ever open source done. Um, by Lulzbot, uh, we've met, we've paid to keep those servers up, keep stuff running, keep stuff open. Um, closing stuff down has not been in our mindset at all. Uh, that being said, we're, we're prone to blunders. It, it can happen, uh, especially in a company that has 10 years of existence, a, a brand that has been around for a long time driving, uh, a lot of that conversation. And to have that kind of get re recreated in what is I call I would I would call definitely a trial by fire. My last year and a half as we've started up Lulzbot again, I, I didn't come from a, a like an open source background. I came from a three D printing background. I had a great respect for open source. I I understood it to an extent, but uh, as, as far as the nuances and and how deep you want to go and where those gray areas are, uh, it's uh, it's quite a mantle. Oh, it gets deep. <laughs> it gets deep. So, so what have you done to find the gray areas to figure out what yeah, you're missing? Uh, and... Well, I mean, to an extent, the best we can do is continue to operate as a business and continue to keep things as open as possible. Um, I'm, I'm sure it comes up as a question, but really, one of the things that's bringing us together tonight is kind of the the discussion about printed solid and enclosures. Um, you know, when you look at it, it's it's an item that's out there. It was made open source. It's always been open source. But how is it how is it being able to be used as open source? You know, there, there's no non-commercial on an item like this. Um, as we start to manufacture and continue to make enclosures for our printers, uh, it, it's something that very much so um, could be looked at as something starts as lulls, but Something's developed for Lulzbot. Something comes back into Lulzbot. But attribution is huge. One thing you'll see on those product pages, one thing you'll see on the download, you'll see it everywhere, uh, would be, have been originally created by David Randolph. I understand that was wrong now. Created by David Randolph and printed solid. Um, one of the things we had to go off of is if you look at the Oshawa website, you can get this handy-dandy little checklist of things that you should do when making an <laughs> open source product, uh, including being emotionally prepared to allow your product project to be copied, which is something that we have went through, you know, <laughs> with, with the Sindaver machine. It, it's a very, uh, we were okay with it. It's why you didn't see stuff like that pop up in social media when it came to that conversation. Um, but th there's things on the list too about, uh, trademark and, and making sure that you have that trademark and stuff. And uh, quite frankly, we don't have printed solids trademark at all. So that what was a gray area. Um, mm -hmm. One that the community quickly brought to our attention um, that I'm hoping we were able to correct and that we can continue to make open source things. It's, it's gotta be a discussion. Definitely. So you just said that you didn't have an issue with Sendaver making the printers, but Correct. when Sendaver launched the Axie, mm -hmm. everyone that carried the Axie and Lulzbot lost their Lulzbot reseller ability. Yep, absolutely. So maybe I can shed a little bit more light. Yeah. That... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So from an open source standpoint, I think there's a big misconception that we were not okay with it from an open source standpoint. Uh, one of the pages brought up a lot is the cloning a Lulzbot page. Mm -hmm. One of the big things in there as far as like us being okay or cool with something is just email us. Let us know about a project you're working on. I mean, if we can help, we will. If we can get you some more files. It was all of a sudden there's, John, did you see this? It's it's our printer. I mean, it's not. but uh, and, and suddenly you're, you're looking at this and you're like, geez, well, what's going on? Who's on the team? 
oh, these were people that worked not just for Aleph and Lulzbot. These these were people that worked for Fane. Well, we were out there in November, December, and throughout. Um, again, glad to hear that they they found jobs in the 3D printing industry and everything. But uh, it was a little shocking. Um, and it's one thing to have competition to sell against competition. It's kind of another to sell against yourself, sell against your machine. It's it's different. I mean, you didn't see any crazy legal battles or anything. We're open source. At the end of the day, build your machine, absolutely. But when you start up, like, uh, let's say, a dealership for a Ford or Chevy or something, if you're a Ford dealership and you start selling brand new Chevys, Ford probably isn't going to let you continue as an authorized dealer for Ford. Uh, maybe that's oversimplifying it, but uh, I'd look at it as a business decision. Um, if you look at the same period of time, one of the things that people didn't see uh, is at one time, Lulzbot had 126 resellers, which mm-hmm. if you can imagine, that that's quite expansive. Uh, roughly this same time period, we were vetting all of these resellers for, do we continue with them? Are they actually selling printers? Is this just a maker space that filled out the paperwork to be a reseller, but they were actually just buying printers for their maker space? Those types of things. Lulzbot definitely encouraged that. They they told me to do that for us. Yeah. yeah. So it's a valid question. Uh, There was a lot of resellers. We, We cut back across the board. Um, we, we definitely weren't a big fan of this. Uh, but I mean, I look at some of those same resellers and I still have a great relationship today. Uh, Zach Ruder at it works. We still work together on different projects and stuff. And he continues to develop great stuff for the TAS six and is sharing it. Uh, obviously the it works tool heads are looking great. Uh, he's testing out some of the, the new magnetic beds, uh, he ordered. So he's thinking that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. that, is he an official Lulzbot reseller? No. Do we have to not have a good relationship? No, by, by no means. Uh, it's, it's just misconstrued to just make it seem like an open source issue when that's more of a business issue. So we did find a reseller that sells both Sendaver and Lulzbots. Is that okay now? Are you cool with that now? I want to take a guess because I feel like they're the ones that fell through the cracks because they weren't like in the industry. Did we just screw that up for them? <laughs> well, damn it, Joe. <laughs> so, so I want to take my guess first because is it Midwest technology products? It is. So we called them, we explained it to them. They didn't, uh, yeah, and that and actually getting people to update their websites and pull stuff down or put new images up or take in, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that, that one is out there. Do we relax our chance to uh, our stance? Do we change our mindset? I mean, this isn't something rigid. Yeah, right. it is a business decision. Uh, it's not irrevocable or anything like that. Uh, at the end of the day, if you have a Lulzbot printer and you call us up, we'll help you with your warranty. We'll help you with support, service, answer questions. Uh, if you bought it from IT or you bought it from Printed Solid, you bought it from whoever, we're still going to help you. It's a, it's our machine. I mean, uh, there's a certain responsibility there uh, overall. Uh, so it, it's a little hazy as far as what the future holds there. Um, as far as Midwest technology products, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that one right now, but, but okay. uh, I, yeah. Well, it brings up a, another question and like you, you kind of covered it, but I'm going to ask it cause I know we're going to get hammered on this week. One of sure. the biggest things that people kept telling me after we announced this was like, you can't be, you, you gotta, you gotta hit every point. You can't just be agreeable cause you're oh. Switzerland too much. Mm-hmm sometimes but like so was it in the reseller agreements that they could lose their um reseller status if they sold a clone was yeah, was that so verbiage there what's really crazy about being a lulzbot reseller uh is we don't do reseller agreements so okay. doesn't exist if we're doing stuff that doesn't make sense and they don't want to do business with us they drop us vice versa so be good to people. <laughs> it's kind of the way to be. 
Okay. Do you is see that, that as of... something that's possibly coming that you're going to start doing reseller agreements? Or do you think that you're going to still keep it open to where yeah, it is just kind of a community? I mean, most of our most of our larger professional distributors, uh, McMaster Card, DigiKey, um, uh, Gosh, I'm blank. Oh, like B and H and others. They're they've always been pretty honest. They they pay their bills on time. Uh, we ship on time. That's as long as that works. And uh, you know, if we have a key account manager with one of those companies, and they want to call and talk about the 3D printing industry or get some recommendations on, in addition to the printers, what filaments should we carry and stuff. Uh, some of that stuff is. Not too difficult. Like uh, you should probably carry black PLA. Uh, that tends to be a very, very popular color and material. But um, it's we're we're pretty easy to work with. Uh, email us, call us, get a hold of us. Uh, we're not a huge team. We're still a small company up in Fargo. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know. I know Lulz bought old old bot was was pretty easy to work with in the same light and I, there were also instances where they almost encouraged companies like Sindaver to do what they did mm-hmm. because they were so restricted with the open source like, like we, we know we could be better if we had a bl touch or if we had a bond tech extruder or if we did this or we did this but we have this philosophy we want to do this we encourage you to go and do that clone and do those mods and sell that printer under a new mantle. It's fine. Go do it. Yeah. Um, you know, I sat in on meetings like that. So. Yeah. And I, I was definitely witness to it as well. Uh, there was actually a company here in Fargo, uh, Protostetics, um, that, uh, developed a machine called the tall boy. And, uh, that's exactly the case. You know, they reached out to Lulzbot, told them what they were doing. Sure. Heck, we got extra parts, we got uh, designs, we got whatever you need. Make this thing a reality. And I want to say we're very similar. Uh, It does help when you reach out. (laughs) That that tends to make things go a little bit smoother. Yeah, I I can see both sides of that. There's like the, if I reach out, are they going to stop me? And if I don't reach out, are they going to like lose their minds? So... What is what is the conversation for reaching out? Like if I wanted to say like, hey, so I, I'm considering making this machine. It is close to a TAS-6. Um, what, like what do you guys – and I'm thinking about selling it. What it, What is that conversation with you? Yeah, uh, probably shoot an email to support at lulzbot.com. Um, we're pretty close-knit as a group. I mean that will make it where it needs to. Um, probably emphasize what – it is what's different about it, um, what your plans are. Uh, we've got a lot of companies in the 3D printing industry that build 10, 15 printers a year. Uh, and then you have companies that build tens of thousands. Um, it's a different scale and it, it takes a different level of coordination. Um, but it, it's good to know about them. Absolutely. Okay. It, this is like a complete tangent sort of with the way the thread of our conversation is going, but I, this was also asked and I I didn't make it into our list of questions. Um, What are you doing with the, the new printer that was teased to make it a better value than some of the Taz clones that are popping up out there? Yeah. So the new printer is, uh, how much can I say? So we've, we've released our teaser video, which was met, uh, it was definitely a mixed bag, but um, it's I can't I can't say a ton about it, but there are some core values to what makes a Lulzbot: uh, reliability, repeatability, and performance. Start with that. Now make a machine in the U.S. on a production scale that's affordable, that's better positioned for the market today not the market three years ago, four years ago. There's been a lot of technological change in that time. There has. So for sure. I, I can't give away a whole lot on the machine yet, but I'm excited. The team here is really excited. Everybody's been working hard on it since uh, day one. Uh, we knew we needed to make something that was our own to dispel the rumor that uh, this is a 
a buy and sell or get rid of the assets or whatever type deal. Uh, not at all. Uh, we're, we're very much so trying hard to make it here in the U.S. and, and building these printers. Cool. Yeah, that was definitely a rumor for a minute. So that's good to hear. All right. Back on the questions. Who's who? I got a quick okay. I got a quick question um, to circle back on the. Uh, you had drawn a parallel to uh, being like a Chevy dealer going to sell Ford cars and like them not being happy. That that kind of makes sense. But if it, it would make sense if you were a, a traditional business. But with those about being a more open source uh, company, which you've mentioned a lot. Um, what kind of message do you think that sends to the community and other resellers when they follow the rules per the license? Like um, you guys have um, Creative Commons share alike and you have GPL version three. Like with the Sindaver, you know, they made the clone. They've released the source with the, with the share like license and the attribution. Mm -hmm. But then you go ahead and then just revoke reseller, yep. you know, re revoke that agreement. And, you know, it, I mean, so to be honest, I feel like that goes completely against some of the core, the core philosophies of open source, which is, you know, I built this thing, I designed it and I'm sharing it, you know, with everybody, you know, feel free to make it your own. Feel free to, you know, depending on the license, feel free to sh sell it commercially. So, um, and the whole point is, you know, just innovation, sharing, you know, fast iteration, whatever. So, like, I don't know, what, what, what kind of, what kind of message do you think that sends when you kind of do yeah, that? So is it I'll... iteration without recourse? Is that, is that the, the thought process behind that? Sorry, go ahead, John. Sure, uh, I'll actually open it up to a wider can of worms. Uh, so when we talk about like FOSS uh, and uh, open source on on the software side, the business side, and internally at an organization. Um, cause another one of those gray areas, especially with open hardware, as opposed to open software, uh, is all the work that goes into actually setting up a company, actually getting those supply chains pumping and stuff. Um, there, I would say it debtors a little bit. Um, and for a long time, I think open software and open hardware have been held to a similar standard. And we might have to look at that a little bit different. Uh, I definitely think it's a conversation for the community. But uh, there's a lot of difficulty that goes into open hardware. It's not as easy as data sharing. Uh, and that by no means does it make it uh, easy for open software. But uh, as long as we're on the topic, let's look at uh, how we are internally. Uh, you know, traditionally, a Linux-based System76 company that could only use uh, like uh, open software variants from FreeCAD to uh, LibreOffice, GIMP, you name it as the tools, they needed to be free software. Um, I would say what we do now is much more hybridized. Uh, if you're familiar with those technologies and you're familiar with those and you can do your best in your role or your position, you're free to them. We still have a ton of Linux machines that are running and we still have FreeCAD. And actually we're running FreeCAD, SolidWorks and Fusion 360. But when it comes to the, the final engineering part, at this point, we're using SolidWorks. It's just easier to do the sheet metal, send out the actual parts in a format that a sheet metal shop of 50 years or whatnot's used to. They can get an accurate quote. They're not emailing you five more times because they can't open the file or whatever. But so, so from a business standpoint, I'd say we're different. We look different internally. Um, but putting that focus back on how do we build the best printer? How do we give people their best chance to succeed at their jobs here? Um, you know, if you've been using a program for 10 years straight, you're pretty good at it. But mm -hmm. if I just hired you to work for Wallsbot and we're in like a really big startup mode, which might be a good way to describe us some days, um, I I'm not going to expect you to be able to work and move and produce as efficiently as using a software you're already familiar with, using Windows, if that's your thing. Um, we're not we're not restricting in the other way either, where we're like, no, you have to use Windows, you have to use SolidWorks, you have, no, it's use what you're comfortable with and uh, you can get the most work done. Uh, so I guess so, what's... So, yeah, back yeah, to the dealer, dealership question, because that's kind of where this all stemmed from. Sorry to cut you off there, but yeah. the... Um, yeah, uh, Again, I look at it more of business. Um, 
there, there is good competition, there's healthy competition, and then there's games that we don't really want to be a part of. Um, yes, the machine is is good as far as I can tell uh, from an attribution standpoint, but um, I don't I don't see any reason to sell against it. Um, it's it's not what we got set up to do. It's not what we're hiring and employing as many people as we are here in the U.S. to build U.S. made 3D printers uh, to have that going on. Um, you know, if the conversation came up, like, would you light label the Sindaver printer? I'd entertain it. I mean, it's it's we've already put the infrastructure in to build that open source design here in the U.S. So let's get the volumes up get the price down lower for the consumer and make something that, that is going to make sense there. So with, with what you were saying with uh, especially allowing people to just kind of create how they want to create work, how they want to work. Um, you said that really what you guys want to do right now is just make the best printer for people. Um, and that's kind of the goal of the company right now. But speaking honestly there's a bunch of companies that are trying to do that and there's you can name a whole list of a bunch of them that are actually like just wanting to make the best printer for people um but what made lulzbot different um before was their community contribution and open source and really emphasizing on what what is going to make the community better how can we make 3d printing this huge focus of the next generation and pushing forward. So what would you say now is your, your kind of self goal for the company besides just making a good printer? Yeah. So the first thing I would do is bring up something that I have not seen enough of. And that's discussion about what does a company get from being open source? Why would you with your company choose to be open source? Now, it is actually pretty straightforward, but you need to have a vehicle to make it work. Um, for example, in the past, Lulzbot did a lot of heavy lifting. They put stuff out there on download, Devel, but you're a maker in Connecticut, and you developed this wonderful thing for the Lulzbot printer that everybody that has a Lulzbot could benefit, of, benefit from. How do you contribute that back at that time? Uh, so one of the first things that you'll see us kind of do is move over to a GitLab where you can do a poll and you can do these different requests and contribute back. And, and we can start looking at these requests and incorporating them into the design. People also have to get more comfortable with that. You know, it's, is it copying? I hope so. I hope it's identical to the thing that you made. And I'm hoping we can tell everybody that you made it. Um, but by bringing it to the larger Lulzbot group, that would be something that a company would stand to gain from being open source. In reality, do people do that? Do they work really hard on these designs and then make sure that the company that they designed this improvement for has access to that, can incorporate that freely? Uh, like I said, it's good in, in theory. It happens. It definitely happens. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. I won't discredit that. It's it's not as uh, frequent as we'd like to make it out to be, but it definitely happens. I, I can I, I have examples of it happening in a box up there in the back corner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh, the Colorado Printing Projects uh, tool head. It is a parallel printing head for the Taz Six that nice. worked extraordinarily well, actually. So. Um, I just want to say I'm a big fan of GitLab. I knew you were going to ping that. <laughs> I, just, I just need to give a shout out. It's a proper choice. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Aaron, you want to take on the next one? But, hey, guys. Oh, yeah. I don't know where yeah, we're yeah. At anymore. There's a, everything that John just said. Uh, somebody brought up a story once about a tech support engineer having to ride his bike to an open or a library to open a .mov file that was sent in for troubleshooting because they didn't have an open source software that could read it. I laughed out loud when I read this because <laughs> I could definitely see it happening. Um, and everybody was like, well, you know, VLC is there for that. VLC is GPLv3, I think. Uh, it was properly open source but it was if the codecs weren't properly open source 
we couldn't use it. Or like there was a situation where there was a Wi-Fi chip that we wanted to use and the Wi-Fi chip itself was open, but the drivers weren't open. So we couldn't like it. Yeah, it was open source to a fault. Um, But one of the things that was like a key core um, kind of tenant of the company was we use open source to support the open source projects and give back to those communities that are giving to us. So like FreeCAD, we used FreeCAD if it didn't work. And you know, we were expected to submit bug reports and we were always running dev versions of FreeCAD so that we could push that development forward. Um, we funded Marlin uh, mm-hmm. because we used Marlin and we pushed all kinds of updates into Marlin. We funded Octoprint. Uh, you know, we gave money back to these open source projects to contribute to them. Have, uh, has fame continued that practice? So the first one on the list that I'd I'd like to get back into would probably be Marlin. Uh, We don't use Octoprint heavily. uh, So it's it's another project that uh, we'd like to look at. Uh, We're in contact with the creator there. Um, It was kind of an interesting back and forth. I really wanted to send her a lulzbot. She didn't really want a lulzbot, but that's okay. Um, Not everybody has room for a bunch of machines. (laughs) uh, coming, Coming right out of the gate, uh, we wanted to get set up. And I think uh, probably in November timeframe, you can find posts that we put out that basically said, yeah, we're putting this on pause. We need to look at this. We need to evaluate this. Uh, are these projects that we're still involved in? Um, and at the same time, you know, was it really fair for quite a few of those projects to kind of go publicly kicking and screaming? Uh, to such a large benefactor of their programs immediately. You know, we didn't even have a chance to connect with most of these groups and already we were being burned at the stake. So we kind of started from the bottom. Um, It's something we want to recundle. We want to do more. We definitely know which projects we're using the most. um, So that just makes sense to me. Are you still using BotQ for the farm? We're not. We uh, have tried. We're still using Beagle Bones. How about that? Okay. We, we still got Beagle Bones running. We, we can reconnect you with the bot Q guy if you want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Justin, we got you if you want it. Uh. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've circled a little, but yeah. So. Okay. Um, do, do, do. Covered that one. Um, I'm going to bring this up. We've, we've beat on a lot of this stuff. Why during the conversation on Twitter, when the, all this originally started, you guys pretty vehemently denied, um, using the, or violating printed solids guides in the attribution. Was that like purely a mistake? Was there, yep. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we thought we were doing it right. Uh, at any time, go to those product pages, go to wherever we had source. We had created, we had the buy, we had David Randolph. That was not right. Uh, I can't say that enough. Uh, We've since edited that to say David Randolph and Prince Solid. Okay. Uh, We won't beat on that anymore. We've beat on that for 45 minutes. Uh, (laughs) Um. This was a rumor right when you guys first came out uh, that you were going to kill Lulzbot Kira and move to something uh, like Simplify, which would have just been like a terrible move because V5 is never coming. Um, <laughs> although Simplify, if you're listening and you want to come talk to us about V5, listen. <laughs> um, are you still, you're still expanding on uh, Lulzbot Kira? I just saw a new download a few yeah. weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, are you contributing back to mainline Cura? Is that your plan? So we have a fork that is kind of at the point of no return as far as turning back into the main thing. Um, that's something we inherited. Yeah. Um, so we can keep doing builds, but uh, the good news is we're in contact with mainline Cura now. 
So we can definitely start looking at what does a 4.8 build look like? How do we get there? Um, I think that's better for Kira overall. Um, and that being said, there's a lot of slicers. We are very good at manufacturing up here in Fargo. We have a lot of great engineers. We do also have a few developers. That being said, we don't have a huge developer team uh, that's able to kind of do the lion's share of what would be a new slicer or something like that. Um, so what I think you'll find in the future is uh, basically Lulzbot printers compatible with more slicers. So that once again, we're giving that freedom back to the user. What do you like to slice with? Yeah, do do that. We'll build a machine that works with that. Yeah. You know, you, you choose what you want to slice. Yeah, I know Prusa Slicers put a little bit of effort into supporting the Lulz bot machines, uh, and it works quite well. Um, still miss, still miss Pathio. Put so much effort into making Pathio work with <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so much really effort. Like that right now. I was happy until you mentioned that. <laughs> that was like that was the biggest kick in the deck for me and Aaron. Uh, yeah, we put, man. I think we were the two strongest beta testers for that. <laughs> so it's just like, you guys going to push a build? No, no, we're not. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chris, you want to ask a question? <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Uh, any plans on switching to a 1.5 or sorry, 1.75 millimeter for some machines or offering that standard on some models? Yeah, so... This is one that I am not sure we ever did figure out why Aleph Objects didn't do. It just, maybe because it's kind of, yeah. Kind of, kind of, <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're going to be doing both. You know, we've already come out with an M1. The M175 is native, uh, uh, 1.75 millimeter filament, um, which kind of goes back to an earlier question and a good one for the community. Um around patented components in an open source machine. Um, I've actually got an M175 running behind me here. And yeah, it says made in the USA, patented right on the front. What is this doing on a lulz bar? This doesn't make any sense. Well, if you look back at some of the technologies incorporated in a lulz bar, even in the past, uh, components from IGUS, from the cable chains, the bushings, these other patented technologies, I don't know if we as a community were just more willing to turn a blind eye and say, well, it's it close enough or, or what it is. But um, we just had a guy on Twitter the other day, Mike Bermudez. He built an M175 all on his own. And we celebrated that fact. How was he able to build that tool head on his own? Every single part that Lulzbot made, designed, developed is open source and it's out there. So everything we've done is still out there. You take the bill of materials, buy the parts, build the thing. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that probably goes back to an earlier question, but yeah, wanted to I throw mean, that out there. That's how I was able to develop the Hamera head for the Mini and the Taz 6, was I took the FreeCAD um, source and remixed it into a Hamera head, and uh, I think I used the the arrow two or the SL or whatever it was called at the time. Um, you know, and it's the current one that is, uh, like a common adapter. Uh, we'll go on the mini, we'll go on the, um, the pros and, and all of that. Nice. So we gotta get, we gotta get sped up on Hamera. I, I heard that the supply chains are back in order. Good. You can get those. There's a lot of really nice tool head components out there right now. Yeah. I love those things. I, I, I printed a Ninja flex, uh, one of Louise's chess pieces at hundred millimeters per second and standard Ninja flex, um, on a mini and it came out awesome. So that is, that is cruising. Yeah. I just, I took the PLA profile and I changed all the speeds to a hundred and I hit print. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And it works. Nice. And I do have to throw that out there, you know, with bed slinger technology that, you know, you get into a rail core or core XY type stuff and speed starts to become the name of the game. But uh, bed slinger tech, you get some speed on it. That's cool. Yeah. 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 
So I've got another question. So uh, with this new printer that you're coming out with, um, during the development, did you reach out to anybody in the community or get any sort of like can, like customer feedback to see like, what would you like to see in a new printer? Like, did you do any sort of yeah, that? Yeah, so most of that was behind closed doors. Uh, we weren't quite uh, doing like a public Twitter poll or something this time around for that type of information. Uh, if you look on Facebook groups and stuff, those types of polls are actually pretty common. So if you just wait long enough, you'll see what people are voting for as far as features they like, how they like their leveling to occur, occur um, what kinds of choices they want to have in a printer. Um, this one is uh, is kind of fun because it's largely veiled at this point. You know, uh, I will tell you soon doesn't mean like a year out. doesn't mean like six months out. It means like soon. We will know stuff soon. And we will have units available to purchase <laughs> at launch, not Kickstarter. Like nothing against Kickstarter or branding or anything there, but just crowdfunding in the 3D printing realm has become really, really common. And we're a larger company. It, it, it should be on us to take that risk when it comes to looking at what best fits the market, what we can get in uh, for quality components to build something that matches that market and then deliver on it and build these things. And at any given time, there's not a 16-week lead time for a, a Mini 2 or a Workhorse or a Pro. Just order it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there shouldn't be a lead time at launch. No crowdfunding. You just order the printer and it goes. All right. That's good to know. There's, there were a lot of assumptions. And it's not an April Fool's joke, right? It's still April Fool's Day. You have time to back out. <laughs> no. I still want to know what the gears are. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good old-fashioned gears. They're not, our, not that old-fashioned. I still have printers running them. <laughs> well, I I loved I loved the April Fool's Day uh, video with Prusa. That that was great. It was. Uh, it was really good. I, I, I thought it was just going to be a jab at you, and I was like, <laughs> when I saw the thumbnail, I was like, uh, <laughs> really, we're gonna do that? But no, it was good. It was really good. Yeah, yeah I liked it. That was good. Um, yeah, uh, we, we took some flack, flack for the, the print quality there. Um, at this stage in the product project, uh, we're largely focusing on profile development for this material on strength. Like these are strong parts. The first question before, does it look pretty is, will it break? Um, we'll get that profile dialed in. I, I have no doubt about that. So can you, can you tell us what the material is? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you guys. So we're going to use a lot of PETG. Uh, we're also going to use uh, ABS. Uh, it kind of depends on what the uh, uh, form and function of the different components are um, for what material. Well, uh, and of course, we use uh, TPUs um, throughout the entire machine. Actually, quite a bit of TPUs. Uh, NinjaFlex uh, at this time. And it's, yeah, it, there are a ton of wonderful material properties available to you that you can print and why not incorporate them at places that make sense in a 3d printer. Um, so not only is this machine, well, geez, I, I don't want to get it too much away yet. But, uh, <laughs> the number of printed parts is going up, not down. So, so, uh, okay. so it's more rep wrappy. very rep wrappy, very throwback, very, All right. very cool. All right. The gear that everybody is fascinated with, um, isn't a functional component by the truest sense of the word. It's literally just there to say, oh, Greg's weights. That's that's cool. That does that piece doesn't do anything, but it looks cool. Um, and those that know what it is, they'll, they'll like it. But nice. Um, yeah, somebody yeah. attributed it to like Mad Max shoulder pads. Uh, it's, it's like yeah, that's pretty great, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, th that answers one of the other questions that we got, which was, uh, will there continue to be printed parts in a little spot? And if so, what materials? And that, yep. that was a good question. Nice. Uh, so do you have any uh, future collaborations or partnerships that you're planning on announcing for 2021? Uh, 
uh, well, we collaborate with everybody in some sense. There's a lot of different, um, like, different grades, I guess you'd say there. I mean, you have people that are influencers in the 3D printing industry or influencers in another industry that are using 3D printers and they don't talk about it enough and they should. You know, that's one type of collaboration. You've got uh, material developers who are constantly coming up with newer, better, lighter weight, you name it for properties on the material side. Uh, so there's a great, great opportunity for collaboration there. Uh, most recently, I'd say like Polyterra, uh, we're kind of helping usher that into the, the public eye because it's it's neat to have a NatureWorks resin material that's affordable like that. And yeah. it's got kind of some pastel colors. Um, so, yeah, definitely materials you'll see more. But then as far as like hardware suppliers, uh, just like our, I guess you could call it a, a partnership with like Slice Engineering or Mosaic Manufacturing, uh, people on, a, on the hardware side a little bit more. Um, You'll see those relationships strengthen and grow. Um, I'm really excited to see a palette three like yeah, in person and, and get to use it some. Uh, eight colors is pretty sweet. Um, I like multi-color printing personally a lot. Uh, so that's I'm very excited for that. Is there any plans to continue the tool changer work that Lulzbot was doing before? Yeah, so the tool changer is a topic of a fairly frequent discussion with E3D. Um, it's one of those where where we started the year and what we had to do to, first of all, get our feet back under us. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time to look at some of the other projects there. Um, I think tool changes are really cool. I think they got a lot of possibility. Uh, people like Filament Frenzy, um, have really, really done a great job of showing that machine um, shine in what it can do. Um, so I, I think we'll see more. Uh, it's generally best when there's a, when there's a great application. Um, let's say you have a user that truly has four different materials that need to be kept at a different milk temperature. Now, now you're talking. Um, I mean, our Pro Dual Extruder does great when it comes to like... Um, two different materials, you know, that, that is still different from multi-color printing. Multi-material printing is, is another animal, especially like that surface between uh, like sport materials and solid plastic and do those two materials play together nice. And, uh, yeah. So I think tool changes are cool. We are, we haven't done a, a ton to contribute to it though. Uh, okay. Is that Aaron, you can ask the 18. Because that kind of leads into, or my question kind of leads into 18. Hmm. Okay. So what is the most interesting thing you have found on the dev servers? Yeah. Um, Lulzbot had like Core XYs a long time ago. Like I, they just didn't move forward with them. Uh, the technology was there. It was developed. It was done. Um it would have been cool to see that out at a time when nobody else was doing Core XY, but it didn't happen. So that was kind of surprising to see. Poor Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah, there's some really cool stuff on Devel. Uh, if you ever get a chance to just start digging through folders. Yeah, if you want to find the Core XY, it's under research projects somewhere in there. But there's like two research projects folders and you got to find the right one. <laughs> it's like a treasure hunt. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so um, in that same light, uh, we're going to see the patent for heated enclosures die this year. What do you, do you guys have anything on the horizon for that? Uh, we just saw the mosaic announcement. That was pretty cool. I was excited yeah. about that. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, I wouldn't say anything in the profession, professional sense. Um, right now we largely build open printers. Um, yeah, we started making enclosures, but I don't know how I feel about how that's going right now. I'm very willing to listen to the community discussion on guidance there, but, uh, we are trying to give as much attribution, um, on that. So yeah, enclosures aren't really 
I don't know. A lot of people print PLA. It's amazing the, the the expensive machines and the highest quality. It's amazing how many people print PLA. Yep. <laughs> so, and yep. some materials don't need enclosures. I mean, if you're doing some hardcore ABS production, uh, like our our print farm is currently doing today, uh, we've got around 250 machines that just print um, ABS. They've got their like rows upon rows of enclosures and doors and stuff. Um, so we definitely understand the um, need for an enclosure and an application that merits it. But if, if you're going to just buy a printer, use it in education, and only use PLA for your examples, um, it, it's kind of out of expense at that point. And it adds problems. Yeah. So, trust me, it adds problems. <laughs> All right. Well, um. We're out of actual questions. What do you want to add? You made some good time. So it's Makers on Tap. I've been working on a project for like five weeks now. And when I get the whole thing done, I'll probably share it in some fashion on social. But uh, I've been working. I'd really like to become a part of the Mandalorian Mercenary Costume Club. So I'm trying to do and like a 501st. <laughs> super good like toothbrush uh, method for weathering. Wow. Um, but I just wow. got the helmet done. Uh, 0.18 layer height, Taz Pro uh, S. Um, oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Did you have to print it in multiple pieces? So that's kind of my, my maker project that I've been eh, pushing along. It takes a long time, especially all the weathering. Yeah. Did oh, you have sure. to do it in multiple pieces? Yes. Yep. So okay. this one uh, is called the Cinderian with an aggressor cut. That's where you get these little like eyeball things on the front. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, like I did the ear pieces separate and stuff. It just makes cleanup a lot faster. You could actually print this whole file in one piece. I just wanted to focus more on like surface finish and stuff, you know, and I've, I actually didn't do Bondo on this one. Uh, as far as some people have, you really have to do a high degree. I just stuck to a, a filler primer and after about three coats or so, yeah, it was smooth yeah. point. Yeah. So I, I was pretty happy with that. The filler primer is nice. I've done that before. Yeah. I just tried the X to C from smooth on and it was awesome, except for it's really easy to like fill your details away. <laughs> like it's it's almost too good. <laughs> One I have seen lately. Now I suck at the sharpening side of it, but card knives for woodworking. I've seen people that put a curled lip on this, and if you're doing um, anything that's kind of like long or smooth or whatever the um, like the gauntlets that I'm working on right now. Actually, I got a, a whole pile of armor over here that I keep going on. But when you're able to just take this and pull it along the edge and just peel rather than have to sand or have to get the plastic to heat up. Oh, it's great. Saves, <laughs> saves so much post-processing time. Nice. Very cool. What else do you have? We've beat up on you for like an hour. <laughs> well, it's needed. I mean, if, if we'd have had a chance to actually get out to some of these community events and, and show them who we are and talk, uh, I think it would help a lot. Um, I've been debating, you know, is there some way where we could have like a, a company sign up and we just take a bus to Murph where, you know, we've got a lot of passionate 3D printer people working at Lulzbot and Fargo now. And they print, they print at home. Everybody prints. It doesn't matter if you're in accounting or if you're in engineering, or procurement, if you're on the uh, assembly line. Everybody has printers. We, we still do the internal like uh, garage sale type deal where as an employee, you can get a, a, a printer affordably. Uh, and I think that's really helped just in general with people's knowledge, um, yeah. how, how the machine works uh, before you just start building this thing and you, you don't know how it works. But um, yeah, we definitely encourage, we do a lot of competitions in house for like every uh, holiday Um so like Valentine's Day was print a red thing. Uh, Halloween, obviously, there's a ton of stuff there. But uh, yeah, it helps build culture internally. Yeah. Very cool. 
Yeah, we at this point, I think we were planning on going to Murph with like the tentative that we won't. <laughs> well, but um, yeah, I, I'm excited that they pushed it back. Uh, I'm hoping that w- it happens. At the very least, I'm hoping Earth happens this year. I'm going two years without a fest will be rough. But for for me and for the timeline and for the word soon, I think it would be really cool to go to Murph and like have something for people to like see that they could buy. Like not necessarily at Murph, but like the product's done, it's out. Yeah. That would be really cool. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, we'll definitely have units there. Okay. Either way, p- people can check them out. That, that, that would be cool. Did, did your heart rate go up when you said that we you hope to sell them at Murph when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I, yeah. That tells you how real it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you said that and everything was fine, you're probably pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So yeah, let's set up the walls back to it and be selling. No, no. That's that's not what Murph's about. Well, if we if there's a virtual event this year, which you know there very much could be, are you going to participate in a virtual event? Yeah, I don't see why not. Uh, I don't know what it looks like. It's kind of hard to know what virtual events look like. Uh, I think Slice did a pretty good job with Verf last year. And what about um, Verf After Dark? Yeah, Verf After Dark. <laughs> <laughs> we were in attendance, and nobody knew who we were. It was just kind of oddly, Lulzbot would lob something out there. But yeah, it's uh, it was fun. Yeah, we we will be doing something for Murph. I don't know if it, it will be there or if it will be virtual. We have, but we will be doing something. And it will be fun, and it will be busy again. Yes, I'm sure. We don't know how to like sign up for half-assing things, so nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's just because I sign us up. Uh. Well, well I, I was even excited. I thought for a while that the, even this would just be kind of a, a podcast, and then I found out, oh, they get there gets to be video. Oh, that's fun. So cool. Yeah, yeah, occasionally we do video. We're trying to do more, but like not having video makes it a lot easier. And yeah. You know. <laughs> Wait, is this video? Yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I am way Why underdressed. Why do you think I'm not wearing an undershirt? <laughs> <laughs> I apologize to everybody. <laughs> I, I just thought you showed up in Aaron's <laughs> uniform, which is like. It, 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 it is my uniform. It's the. <laughs> River City, River City Labs tanks. Nice. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. It's my brand. Well, well yeah, I I'm out. I got I got <laughs> I got lots of stories I could tell, but like hmm. that that was something. The font font of knowledge from every person I'd ever talked to that was a former employee, uh, and the stories, the experiences both good and bad. Um, uh, that was something I, I personally got to um, experience in, in here. And uh, what a place. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you my stories at, at an event with beer. Um, <laughs> my stint was short, but it was interesting. Um are you still in contact with uh with Jeff at all? Have you like talked to Jeff at all? You know, the one time after the acquisition where um we communicated what he did I thought was was pretty noble. Um it was during COVID uh and he reached out to us cuz he knew we had a ton of Innova 1800 and he bought it by the pallet load to get it out there to Colorado so people could start printing. Um Wow. I haven't really heard from him since, but I, I thought that was that was a pretty pretty good thing to do. Yeah, that was that's good. Yeah. And Innova is like perfect for the PPE stuff. It's a nice ductile yeah, that, and yeah. So yeah, he, he reached out, we had it, we just made it happen. So I, 
if there was somebody printing in Colorado and, and they had found their way to free filament or something, that's probably where it came from. Nice. Yeah, you sent uh, you sent us some free filament for PB. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. we were we were in the similar similar boat. You know, if people needed it last spring, uh, we tried to throw it on every social platform. Just send us a send us a picture. Basically, prove you're going to print with it, and then we'll figure out how to get it to you. Uh, yep. At that time, we had a lot of two eight five, so that didn't necessarily mean you'd be able to use it. But um, yeah, we just it was more important at that time to get filament out to people. And that the printer's not sit idle. Yeah. We made lots of masks. So that was, you found a place that had a lot of lull spots. So it was, it was, it fit well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you guys have anything else? I think at this point I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Thanks. Well, again, thank you all for having me. Uh, it was, Kind of a fun experience. Uh, this is a new, um, I guess, kind of format for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, it worked well. Yeah. Well, when you get closer to launching the new printer, let us know and we'll circle back and see what we can do then too. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be fun to field some more questions and at that time actually talk a little bit more about what uh, what it looks like. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. All right. Well. With that, guys, keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. And-